Welcome to the Supported Living Property Podcast with your host, me, Lisa Brown, the place to learn about supported living property investing. Hi, Jonathan. It's great to have you here today. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, Lisa. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. For people who don't know you, do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a bit about you? Yeah. Hello. I'm, I'm, I'm Jonathan Spencer. I'm the acting chief executive of the uh, housing charity Zetetic Housing. It's the it's the charity with the name that no one can pronounce and and no one knows what it means. But 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 we do. And, and it's very, very important to us. And, and perhaps we'll explain a little bit about that later. Um, I uh, have worked for Zetetic now uh, for nearly four years. Um, I initially came as the deputy chief executive uh, and now I'm the acting chief executive. Before that, I worked uh, a tremendous amount with disability um, and profound disability uh, in the charity sector. And um, I have, uh, I went into that sector really because, because that's in my family. My eldest daughter um, has a, a learning disability and my sister's eldest daughter also. And the impact of that uh, made me feel that I wanted other people not to have to go through the kind of same kind of things that I'd gone through whether it was the struggle with disability or for that matter the struggle to find housing and housing it seems to me is at the root of many of society's ills Um, people without housing are very very easily marginalized and so I wanted to do something that would help that or correct that Fantastic. And so really good insight into both sides from from where you are now. Um, for, do you want to talk a little bit about the? I, I'm going to say the organisation again, because I'm terrified I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> because <laughs> I've been calling it for the last year, completely the wrong name. So tell us a bit about the name and, and why it has that name. So uh, Zetetic, um, and spelt in a slightly archaic way with the K at the end there, uh, in fact, at my interview, I was asked, you know, should we should we keep this this name? Now, I like it, Zetetic, because it's a kind of Cliff Richard name. I don't know if you know that Cliff Richard was uh, um, originally going to be called Cliff Richards, but his manager decided to knock the S off. And the idea there was that um, uh, people would get the name wrong and he could ring in and say, you know, actually, it's not that it's Cliff Richard and his name would get said over and over. So most people, once they kind of meet with us and we, we go through how to pronounce the name, eventually never forget it. So we've got a few lessons later, Lisa, for you, especially <laughs> set aside, on how to pronounce it. So um, the name actually means to proceed by inquiry and it derives from, we were started by our founder, uh, Gary Scott, and uh, Uh, Gary had been doing some care in Croydon and met a family whose uh, daughter uh, was housed in a secure unit, as many people with learning disabilities were um, 15, 20 years ago. And the secure unit was in Yorkshire, uh, you know, miles and miles away from from where they lived. Their access was very, very difficult. And he... um, he heard about this just before uh, Christmas, kind of slept on it over Christmas, thought about it. And then in the new year, he went looking for this young woman, uh, found her in a secure unit, found a property for her um, in, um, in Croydon and got her moved out with the help of social workers and the family and so on, so that they could be closer together and she could be in some supported living. And the the inquiry thing really is about at that point when you you know people weren't really asked it just just done to you you were put in somewhere now if you ask people that have capacity or even minimal capacity would you rather live in your own home they'll say yes they would and if you ask the families would you rather your you know, you know your child was put in a secure hospital or was put in their own home where you could visit and take part and be together their answer is generally yes so when you inquire you often get a different answer than when you go down a kind of, oh, we've researched this and 500 people out of 600 really desperately want to be in a secure hospital. The reality is actually, you know, not necessarily like that. So um, Gary decided to call the organisation Zetetic because when he made inquiries, he found a very different answer to the one that seemed to be the kind of popular one of the day, which was put people with with learning disabilities, even with autism and, and even mental health problems into these secure units where they didn't really need to be. 
And sadly, we've still got far too many people in secure units, haven't we? We have, yes. Yeah, um, and that uh, the root of a lot of that is housing still, isn't it? You yeah, know, it is. Yeah, housing for people, it is. So yeah, and and cultural change has impacted housing, you know, a lot. As I said, I think you know it is at the root of a lot of problems. It is uh, um, at the root of marginalisation uh, as well. I mean, the the difference very often with people with learning disabilities who are our main beneficiaries as a as a charity is that their families will normally pick that up and, and try to look after them and try to house them and, and so on. But what where where the research rather than the inquiry has what what it has shown is when you give somebody with learning disabilities their own place to live with support, that their well-being and their health, you know, their their, their general sense of themselves all goes, you know, up. Uh, you know, really quite significantly. Um, and so that there are less of a pressure on the health service, less, less of a pressure on social services and, and so on. So generally it's better for them and it's better for, for society. So, and, and that integration as well, because I mean, what we do that I think is very, is unique and different from other organizations is we facilitate access to the private sector for a group that wouldn't normally get a private sector rented property. So they're integrated into the community. And often that has a very positive impact on the community itself, not just on, on the individual that we house. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So your your tenant group is predominantly, your beneficiaries, because you're a charity, is predominantly um, people with learning disabilities. Yes. So they would be entitled to um, exempt rents under housing benefit. Is yes that correct? that's correct yes um but obviously th that's under scrutiny massively at the moment isn't it the exam well uh, it, it's it's been um it's been quite challenging because you know everybody's been under a lot of uh, scrutiny that's in the um uh, exempt housing exempt provisions sector uh this is because you know in the, the midlands and in birmingham uh there were essentially criminals who who were um, gaming the system to 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 make millions out of um, really what's a very difficult situation in housing. Uh, exempt provision really is is a provision of a of a type of housing where the support with that housing goes above and beyond what's normally given to people with general needs, and uh, that um, that kind of of provision is really there and used a lot by councils because they get a subsidy back from the government for, um, for the provision of that kind of housing. So what, what, what happens is that, that housing has been so severely underfunded for so many years that councils fall back on exempt provision because they're not really truly paying for it. They're only paying, you know, generally for, for part of it, sometimes they get the full, a full 100% subsidy. Um, and the, these pirates, as we might call them, you know, have, have kind of stepped in, have seen that weakness that, that exists and then provided substandard housing, uh, housing, you know, without ethics, without best practice. Uh, and of course, this, this was then, you know, discovered, the government uh, investigated and, you know, changes that occurred in, in the way that councils had to scrutinise who actually was an exempt provider and you know the standard of property they were providing the best practice that they were um using and, and so on i mean we're, we you know we're very transparent very open we're a charity we're not there to to make money out of councils you know local authorities in in any way and uh fortunately we are we've been very successful through the scrutiny in proving that we are exempt providers but hopefully it has caught out those that are providing you know, poor housing. Because what's important here is, is not the money, it's not really the housing, to be honest with you, it, it's the tenants themselves. It's people that, you know, that don't necessarily have others to speak up for them or other ways of obtaining you know, somewhere to live and to have a home. Because that's, you know, it's not just a house, is it? it, it it's yeah. a home. It's mm -hmm. a home, you know, as we all know, we may, buy our house but ultimately we want to make it into a home absolutely and it's about that sense of security and belonging and all the other things that come with your home exactly yeah. yeah that we we all you know it's somewhere that we all should feel safe and and that's for a universal right isn't it really yeah with um we we talked a bit about the exempt 
rents and, and why they're there. And I think just to kind of be a bit clearer about that, it's, you know, because I think some people think, oh, it's, you know, some people say it's a bit of a dark art. The exempt rents world is all a bit mysterious. Yes. And um, and I think it is a bit confusing for people. But I think it, it the basic principle of it is, is it's for somebody who has a highest need, isn't it? A higher housing need. That's um, correct. Yeah. Somebody who couldn't support the tenancy on their own. But yeah. They need support and they need some level of of care and support as well. So um, most of our tenants have something between the kind of intermittent support going into the the household to 24 7 with sleepovers and and so on to to make sure that they're either might be a a, a sleeping sleepover rather than a waking night um but it's there to make sure that they're okay and um uh that uh they're they're able to to manage within their environment and so you guys would be providing the support as well for those individuals um, so we we provide uh, a level of support, but the care is provided by another organisation because the best practice is to separate the housing from the care. And the reason for that is to empower the, 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 the person themselves, because you might not like your carer, but if the care company is also providing the housing, then you could get a little bit unstuck there because they go, well, if you don't like Jimmy looking after you, you can't live here. Equally, you might not like the house and you might be want to, to be moved on. We had some uh, tenants in Croydon that wanted to move to the seaside. And we, because we're both in South London and along the South Coast, we were able to, you know, to create that. But again, it, you know, if it's all care and housing mixed together. So if you don't want to live here, you know, you, sorry, you can't have this and this and this. So it, it, it it's important to make that division so they can be empowered to make choices if they want to about where they want to live and who they want to um, have look after them. What we provide is um, a whole sort of section of support from uh, easy read tenancies all the way through to 24 seven um, maintenance. Um, and the importance of that is that uh, a general needs um, uh, a landlord might not accept that um, their tenant has ripped the kitchen door off three, you know, in in on a, a unit three times, where we will just keep going back and putting it back and looking for ways to try and stop it being ripped off. But that's what we're there to do. Or equally, if they've been called out for an emergency, it might only be a utilities emergency. There is no electric, there is no heating or whatever. But we will go out for where we know our tenants, and that's really important. We might go out for a dripping tap because that dripping tap for somebody who has a particular type of, of autism, you know, may change their behavior totally so that they become, uh, you know, aggressive or they might start, as we say, ripping the doors off the kitchen to try and find or the bathroom, you know, to find where that drip is coming from. So we understand that their well-being is really important and therefore we offer that service and uh, um, they or the care company can ring a number and we have that 24-7 support for somebody to go out and, and sort things out. And does that come under that exempt housing benefit? Do you get funded for that additional support? Yes, that's um, we. <laughs> now, this is where it all becomes a little bit complicated, because now with a greater scrutiny, what we charge in our rents for the support that we have to provide to prove we are exempt providers, we then don't get funded for. So we don't get funded for it through housing benefit. It's actually then it's taken off. Um, it's it, the government have told the local authorities that they don't have to pay for that part of it. And we're expected to find that um, part through other means. So it does seem a little bit odd, but it's it's just, I think, a way and we understand it's a way of of trying to protect this area, to not make it into dark arts, to not allow others to come in and exploit it. And I would rather that they did that, in all honesty, um, because what we want is we want good homes for people that are marginalized normally we want to be able to give them access we want them to be looked after we want them to have the support and care that they they rightfully deserve um, and and make a difference to their lives and their families it, it, it's the family as a whole that's important here um we had a a 15-year uh, birthday party up in a park in croydon and um 
it was a lovely su sunny day we were very lucky um it was towards the end of the summer not in that that heat wave in the middle um but we had you know parents come and there's some parents who you know who came to me and and said that um you know they were so happy about the the, the property that their child had got and um you know that the impact on them was well you know we we hardly see him anymore and it, it was and and it was that more more natural feeling of of a parent who had let a child go who was happy in where they were living and felt secure and comfortable and therefore wasn't ringing back to their parents all the time for help support or needs and 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 so on and it's that sort of thing where we get that feedback that we know we've been successful oh completely so as a charity you have to make up that shortfall the use to use charitable funds to make up that shortfall is that how you would operate uh, yes, yes. I mean, different ways. We don't do um, a great deal of fundraising or anything like that, but we do. We we manage our our income extremely carefully. Um, you know, no, nobody has a, a a kind of big jag and a and a Turks and Caicos account. You know, it, and and this is the thing that we obviously we push to to local authorities. We're not here to make money from you. We're here to make sure that the tenants are okay. So. We manage the money well, and through that, we we enable you know a makeup of shortfall, which we do in other respects as well. When um, sometimes we write off money because you know people have not been able to pay rents or the money hasn't come through, and different things occur and and so on. You know, we're there for the tenants. That that's the main thing for us. And in what ways, with you being a charity, is it different? Because obviously, there's lots of different housing associations and so in what ways being a charity is different do you think um i think like you said that you've not got the you've not got you know you, you're a not-for-profit organization so therefore no yeah. one is driving a jag in the organization but you know no i i think um i think it, it makes us different in in some ways because uh the local authorities in the exempt provision area only get a 60 percent subsidy return from us where other housing associations who are fully regulated are allowed a hundred percent return, and there are many councils that are questioning this, especially given the recent news of of HAs who've been providing poor substandard housing, who've not been doing best practice and are not necessarily ethical. Um, they're wondering why that split ever occurred between a sixty percent subsidy and a hundred percent subsidy. Um, I think. It's made us think as a charity about uh, the regulator and what we want from it. And as somebody, you know, really with a background in in care, where the CQC is very strong and your inspection is very important, and you know, you have these different areas that the, the, that the CQC is going to look into and say, are you outstanding, good, or do you need improvement? We feel that uh, the regulator who can only operate with the tools that the government gives it needs a different set of tools for you know the the modern housing environment um and that environment should be mean they should be more like the cqc that it, the regulator should be easy to join um you know providing your setup in the right way and then it is about inspections after that that determine not just whether you're giving um, below market rate rents, but whether the quality of your, your housing is good, whether your involvement of, of tenants and tenant engagement is good and, and so on. Now, those things are supposed to be there anyway, but there's no systematic uh, um, inspection of those, uh, of those areas. And, and we feel that, that that needs to change. But I mean, ultimately our position will always be one of, of ethics, of best practice as an exempt provider of supported living properties. And, you know, our, our, our regulator is, is the Charity Commission, um, who, you know, who are, are a, a, you know, a proven organisation, you know, regulating and, and, you know, we know have ch charities out because they, they've not been doing what they should be doing. So we have a very strong trustee board who are very concerned with our with good governance and and as well as uh, tenant engagement. So these things hopefully all come together, you know, for us as a as a unique housing charity offering something a little bit different from others. And it places you 
in a, a really like you say a really unique position doesn't it where you can you can do things a little bit differently and I think it's it's really useful to hear your voice in this because I think there's a lot of um a lot of people are confused about how partly how all the different organizations fit together in a supported living home and I think that's been really useful but also just seeing how how it works differently when you talked about the 60 percent um that the local authorities get that's get backs from central government isn't it when they're looking that's at correct the yes it is yeah and I think you know it's interesting isn't it because as I say you know housing has been so underfunded for so long across the board that um a lot of authorities have grasped at that uh, at that percentage you know and providing some kind of housing in some kind of way that could be seen as exempt becomes highly necessary to them otherwise their homelessness you know goes right up and in that process of of desperation really because there is a housing crisis an ongoing and continuing housing crisis that's only got worse um there are other people who are unscrupulous who see that desperation and will prey on it and Although the government have tried to do things like bring in the scrutiny and so on, um, I'm not sure that that necessarily you know, works in the right way. And we also can see from those housing, housing associations and housing organisations that are supposedly regulated, that actually the tools the regulator has got has not helped in terms of mouldy you know houses houses that are full of damp and houses that are substandard it hasn't helped at all something needs to be done there really to make sure that housing standards are up that, that maintenance is 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 uh, good and that tenants themselves are engaged in you know what goes on within the organization we we are very kind of big on, on tenant engagement. It's a difficult thing with people sometimes with learning disabilities. We have everybody from people with high level autism all the way through to those that might not be able to easily communicate. Um, but we are looking all the time for ways of making that communication, of involving their voice in what we do. So every board meeting, our board meetings start with a a tenant story and something of the tenant voice to remind us all that we may be looking at the books or we may be looking at governance but ultimately these are the people that we're there for and we need to stick on that track as a, the, there's quite a few property investors listening there's quite a few care provider organizations listening um yes. how do you have any advice for them about sort of how they would D differentiate the organizations that they work with you know like any questions they should be asking or due diligence they should be doing when they're looking at actually which which housing organizations they want to be working with i mean i i i would say you know that that um you know you need to look at an organization's values and behaviors and whether those things are acted out our our, our values which we call our bedrock values are um are again like the tenant engagement there Front, front and center, central to what we do. Um, we too, you know, when we examine other organizations, we have our own framework for care companies we partner with. Um, you know, care companies are very welcome to apply to, to go onto that framework, but we do checks on, we do credit checks. We want references. We need to understand what's going on in, in your, you know, your accounts and anybody that's, that's you know, transparent and, ethical will not be unhappy about telling you any of those things if they are they're probably not the best organization to be working with um, and that's what we need in this field we need a sense of openness we see, need a sense of collaboration and, and cooperation now obviously not everybody's a charity there are other people there that, that are looking to make money but their values are, need to be up front as well so you know we like to make a little bit of a surplus because we want to, you know, to reinvest. And, and certainly we know developers, if we can, you know, where we have made um, good partnerships with them, the money they make is put back into another property. And, and, you know, then we will get first choice on that property because we've worked with them before. And we're very happy to work with small developers or larger developers. But the larger developers, we need to bring commissioners in there as well because we're not going to take on 
uh, large properties um, for long leases uh, without the promise from a local authority that that actually that they will be be filled. I mean, we offer a fantastic deal. We we cover voids. Um, you know, really, we handle the maintenance. You hand over your property, and and you know, we we pass you the money because you know we're a good business as well as a good a good charity. Um, I I think. For for care companies, especially the newer ones, I think it's it's hard um, to get in into this area because a lot of um, organisations want some kind of longevity and stability that goes with that. So you know we're looking for organisations that have been around at least a couple of years, so that we know we can see their books and see the way things are, are going. Um, the other is about you know my advice here is you know don't put all your eggs in one basket be very wary you can have a contract that's worth a quarter of a million pounds for one person in, with with learning disabilities and you might have three of those and you're turning over 750,000 but you lose one and and you know that that's a big loss and there is a lot of flexibility at the moment with local authorities with um with uh the families and the, the tenants themselves they might say i don't want to be with you anymore i want to be in that house but actually that house is not going to accept you as a care company so be be careful about those things you know and build your business carefully um and i i think the other thing for us is that we're very aware that there are some smaller housing associations some smaller charities who may be struggling right now um, we have been very successful over 15 years, continue to be so, um, and are very happy to work in close partnership with anybody that needs help or needs support or assistance or just cooperation to get to a better place. You know, do contact me. Um, you know, I'm easy to find. You can go to our website at zhc.org.uk. And we'll pop uh, your contact details in the show notes as well. John. That'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. But I mean, what, what we're about here is is not saying, oh, we've got this way of doing things. Only we can do it. Um, we'll happily show others. You know, if you're from another part of the country that we don't work in and you want to come and visit and talk to us about what we do so that you can repeat that, you know, again, you know, contact me. Um, and I say that, you know, to go back to developers who are often the bit that's left out of, of the equation, we think about the care comes, we think about the tenant, we think about commissioners and so on, is that we have a great relationship with a number of developers. Uh, some, you know, we've, we've built up over time. Others will just send us their blocks of development, not literal blocks, but, you know, they'll have... 10 or 11 houses that they've developed and then moving on you know six months later they'll have another 10 or 11 and they'll just send us those and tell us the areas or they'll say to us which areas are you looking at right now and we'll tell them and and we make that link and then it might be one house that pops up and then we start that relationship from there and build on that and I think that's that's very important for developers to understand the promise in in the the area that we work in of, of exempt housing is not often an immediate big one. It's often starts small and works towards, you know, something else. So, you know, we have developers who've done, you know, 10 apartment houses for us, but that was after we built a, a platform with them. It's all about relationships, isn't it? So much it is, it. yeah. It really it is, is. And yeah, building that yeah. relationship and trust. Jonathan, thank you for that. It's been really, really great talking to you today. Thank you for sharing all that advice. And like I said, we'll pop your contact details in the show notes so people can find you. Thank great. You. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. Really good. Mm -hmm.